Bishop Cabby Pennis to make the introductions of our guest. <clears throat> Thank you, Mark. Um, nothing like prayer to quieten a group down. Uh, I am the assisting bishop um, in this diocese of um, Olympia. I'm retired from Delaware. Uh, I'm um, a member of the Episcopal Bishops Committee on Israel-Palestine, which is one of the sponsors here tonight. Uh, I'm also uh, a partial founder and on the executive committee of a group, a new group, called the Palestine-Israel Network, which is a subset of the Episcopal Peace Fellowship. There's some other members in the room. How many of you belong to the uh, network? See, there's some here. Good. Uh, we have just re-edited some superb Presbyterian material called Steadfast Hope to put in it uh, the Episcopal, the Anglican story uh, in the Middle East, which is a long story and an important one. Uh, it's superb material. I encourage, I implore you, uh, there's some copies back there. $10 is very little for the excellence of this. And it contains also a DVD in the back. So before you leave tonight, pick up a copy, give us your 10 bucks or an IOU, as the case may be. Um, I want to introduce our guest tonight with the words of a person who has been in this cathedral, in this very room, many times, both before and after uh, he became a Nobel laureate. Desmond Tutu said, I have been to Palestine where I have witnessed the radically segregated housing and humiliation of Palestinians at military roadblocks. I can't help but remember the conditions we experienced in South Africa under apartheid. We could not have achieved our freedom without the help of people around the world using the nonviolent means of boycott and divestment to compel governments and institutions to withdraw their support for the apartheid regime. Omar Bagudi's lucid and morally compelling book is perfectly timed to make a major contribution to this urgently needed global campaign for justice, I'll say it again, justice, freedom, and finally peace. I can tell you very briefly that um, Omar was born in 1964, so he's a young man in my lights. That's when I was ordained, as a matter of fact, ordained. <laughs> He's a founding um, committee member of the Palestinian Campaign for the Academic and Cultural Boycott of Israel. He's currently studying for a master's degree, I think, at Tel Aviv University. That must be an interesting, uh, that's finished, finished, okay. Uh, he was born in Qatar, grew up in Egypt, and now lives in Ramallah in the West Bank. He has a master's in electrical engineering from Columbia University in New York. He's an independent Palestinian political and cultural analyst whose opinion columns have appeared in several publications. He's a human rights activist. He's been involved in the civil struggle to end the oppression and the conflict in Palestine. He's the author of a book available to you tonight over here, called Boycott, Divestiture, and Sanctions, The Global Struggle for Palestinian Rights. I ask you to join me in welcoming Omar Pagouti. Uh, thank you very much for the warm welcome. Thanks for having me at your cathedral. I truly appreciate the principles and the courage it takes in the current political situation to host uh, this discussion, this dialogue about uh, civil 
nonviolent resistance to Israel's occupation and other forms of uh, oppression. In my talk, uh, this evening, which will be a PowerPoint, so I'll talk about the slides that you will see. I will try to explain the motives behind BDS, how the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. and Nelson Mandela have influenced the movement, uh, why is it pertinent in the U.S. to be active in BDS, given the, your whole set of troubles in this country? Why do you need to worry about Palestine or Palestinian rights? for that matter. I'll try to put this in the global context, but also with a local focus on, on the US. I'll start with King. For those who cannot see in the back, I'll read it. The deep rumbling of discontent that we hear today is the thunder of disinherited masses rising from dungeons of oppression to the bright hills of freedom. In one majestic chorus, the rising masses singing ain't gonna let nobody turn us around, Martin Luther King. And Mandela, who famously said, our freedom is incomplete without the freedom of the Palestinians. In both cases, uh, both leaders, both moral leaders, despite the massive political difference between them, the, the very big differences in struggles, both adopted a, a notion that you have to decolonize your mind first and foremost in order to decolonize your reality. In order to have your freedom, you have to start by freeing your mind. And the incarceration of the mind is also what we try to face and challenge in the BDS movement, in the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement. For decades, Israel, uh, with a system of oppression, tried to convince us that it's impossible to win it's impossible to resist. Israel is so powerful, it's the fourth strongest army in the world, has a massive arsenal of nuclear weapons, it's supported by the world's only empire, yours, <laughs> uh, and, and so it's impossible to, to fight that mass, uh, massive power. So you might as well give up and accept the crumbs that we throw to you. Uh, but learning from experiences of resistance from Mandela, from King, and from our own roots, and I'll talk about that uh, later, our Palestinian decades of, of civil nonviolent resistance, which is often ignored by the media in this country, we learned one thing, that you shall not colonize our minds. You can take the land, you can kill many of us, but you will never convince us that there is no hope that one day we will be free. We've seen it happen before, there's no reason not to believe it will happen again. Just very quickly about the geography, history. Uh, um, this is the map of pre-1948 mandate, British mandate Palestine, when it was under the British mandate. This, the second from the left, from your left, is the 1947 UN partition plan, uh, with the yellow part being the, the Arab state that was given through that partition plan. Uh, the third from the left is de facto what Israel established itself upon, which was far more than what was given to it in the partition plan, and how it established itself is the most important point. The partition plan did not say that Israel is allowed to ethnically cleanse the majority of the Palestinian people. Between 700 and 800,000 were systematically uh, uh, ethnically cleansed by Zionist militias and later by the State of Israel, um, f well before any Arab army went into British Mandate Palestine, and well after the war was over. So ethnic cleansing is how Israel was created on the ruins of Palestinian society. And, and then the last part is, you see, the settlements, the wall, the Jordan Valley being divided. So the yellow part is the, the, the few patches that are left for Palestinians to live on. Truly, Bantustans, as in the South African case. Um, just some facts. The Palestinian Bureau of Statistics published that the Palestinian population in 2011 reached 11.22 million. Of those, 12% are inside the 1948 territory, which is Israel now. It's, they're citizens of the state of Israel. 12% of the Palestinian people. 
38% are in the occupied Palestinian territory, OPT, that's the West Bank, including East Jerusalem and Gaza. 50% are outside historic Palestine, British Mandate Palestine, 50% are in exile, those who were ethnically cleansed and their descendants. So when people talk about ending the occupation as the only form of, of justice, that's not sufficient because it does not address the rights of the majority of the Palestinian people. Ending the occupation is ending one form of injustice that's carried against the Palestinian people. It's important to keep in mind human rights of the entire Palestinian people. So Palestinians in the occupied territory are 37% compared to all other Palestinians outside the occupied territories who are 63% of the Palestinian people. This is why the Palestinian Civil Society BDS call, when it was first issued in, on 9 July 2005, signed by the great majority of Palestinian civil society, trade unions, uh, women's groups, political parties, students, youth, just about everyone signed on the BDS call. So it's a great majority of the Palestinian people. It focused on the three basic rights that Palestinians are entitled to under international law. Ending the 1967 occupation, ending the system of racial discrimination, which is a form of apartheid, and I'll explain that a bit more later, inside Israel itself, which are laws and policies that Israel practices against its own citizens who are not Jewish, the indigenous Palestinians. Third, recognizing the refugees' right to return according to UN Resolution 194. As refugees in any conflict zone, they're always allowed to go home. Palestinians have no less of a right to go home. So the BDS call focuses on all three basic rights. And basically we called for BDS because the UN, under the hegemony of your government, uh, was unable, unwilling, or both, to stand up for Palestinian rights. The UN has failed to bring our rights. So we had to resort to what our South African comrades have done. Go to the international community and ask people of conscience, citizens around the world, to stand up for justice in our part of the world. This is how the BDS movement was born, and it's led by the largest Palestinian civil society coalition called the BDS National Committee, or BNC. So, as I said, we're focusing on self-determination of the Palestinian people, which at a minimum has to involve the three basic rights. Without that, we cannot exercise our right to self-determination. So the first part, the 1967 occupied territory. There are many aspects of this occupation, from gradual ethnic cleansing, colonization, the siege of Gaza, which was called by Richard Folk, who happens to be Jewish, he's the UN Rapporteur for Human Rights, called it, in, said that the, the, the Israeli acts in Gaza involve acts of genocide. He used that term very specifically. And once he said it's a prelude to genocide, what Israel is doing through its siege of, of Gaza. And the last bit, those of you who were in Hebron, Al Khalil, must have seen the graffiti on the walls there Arabs to the gas chambers, no comment. So I'll talk more about 1967 and some aspects of the occupation. I can't talk about the entire occupation, but some aspects the culture of racism and impunity that's prevailed in Israel has reached a very, very dangerous level. Army platoons in Israel compete who produces the most controversial t-shirt design. And in this particular design, which was exposed by the newspaper Haaretz, a very famous Israeli newspaper, uh, this has uh, the crosshair on a, a pregnant Palestinian woman's belly, and it says, one shot, two kills. And in Gaza, during the attack, end of 2008, early 2009, the use of white phosphorus against UN shelters, which was largely condemned by international human rights organizations, as well as the United Nations. And of course, Amnesty International famously produced an excellent report on, called Thirsting for Justice, about Israel's denial of Palestinian water rights as a means of expulsion of the Palestinians from certain parts of the West Bank. So denial of water, you cannot even collect rainwater in the West Bank, 
rainwater falling on your land is not yours. It belongs to the occupier. If you dare to dig a cistern, a water well, as Palestinians have done for centuries, the army will go in and destroy it. This is illegal theft of water because you're stealing the occupier's water on your land. And amnesty focused on all that. And of course, the, the use of Palestinian children as human shields, which was exposed in the UN report on Gaza and on Israel's practices in the West Bank. In several UN reports, this issue of using Palestinians as human shields, especially children, uh, was exposed. Uh, so to us, really, to exist under this system of oppression is to resist, because we are reduced to living in ghettos, literally surrounded by walls, with policies that are very reminiscent of the most racist era in Europe. And about Palestinians living in Israel, those who stayed despite the Nakba of 1948, what they're facing are laws and policies that very much conform to the definition of apartheid under international law. And I promise I'll talk about this later, I'll talk about it now. When we say Israel is practicing apartheid, we're not saying that Israel is identical to South Africa. Of course it's not. There's so many differences. But the recently held Russell Tribunal on Palestine, which is a citizen's tribunal with many luminaries uh, who participated in it, including Alice Walker, the famous writer from this country, and many jurists from South Africa, from elsewhere, including uh, Roni Kastrils, who's a, who was a Jewish minister in the government of South Africa post-freedom, in the Mandela first government. Roni Kastrils was uh, a minister in that government. He was in that jury, and they reached the conclusion that Israel is practicing apartheid against the entire Palestinian people, not just in the West Bank and Gaza. Um, and this manifests itself in many different ways. One of the most blatant ways it manifests itself is land ownership. The Jewish National Fund, which is a colonial entity that has participated in ethnically cleansing Palestinians since the early 20th century, uh, has veto power on the Israel Land Administration, which manages 93% of the land of Israel, making it effectively impossible for non-Jews to buy uh, lease, rent, any land, on 93% of the land of Israel. The indigenous Palestinians who are citizens of Israel cannot buy this land. It's off limits. So imagine the equivalent in the state of Washington. You say, oh, we have a majority of Christians, Jews in this country cannot buy land in the state of Washington because it's a Christian nation. It's reserved for the Christian nation, as some lunatics, lunatics in this country would like to have. But, but this is the norm in Israel, and it's in the law. It is not just a policy. Israel does not have a constitution, as you know, but it has basic laws which are equivalent to a constitution. In those basic laws, it has straight discrimination against its non-Jewish citizens. One other aspect that ch churches and mosques Palestinian churches and mosques that Israel got control over during the Nakba. This is one example, the Ma'lul uh, Palestinian Roman Catholic Church, which was treated as a cattle shed by Israeli settlers in the area until 2005. Palestinian Christian communities were not allowed to, to uh, uh, renovate the church, to take control over it, to have any prayers in it. They were not allowed to use it until then. Since 1948, till 2005, it was used. The Ein Hod Mosque uh, fared even worse. It was used as a bar restaurant with alcohol being served in it, and it still is used as a bar restaurant in the village of Ein Hod, which was completely ethnically cleansed of its Palestinian inhabitants, turned into an Israeli Jewish artist colony. And many of the Palestinians of Ein Hod who are ethnically cleansed live very close to their village, watching their houses, their beautiful, picturesque village occupied by Jewish Israeli artists every day. This must be worse than the refugees in Lebanon who cannot see what happened to their houses. This is daily torture. And of course, the Bedouin village of Araqib inside Israel, which was destroyed tens of times by the Israeli army because it's an unrecognized village. It's an illegally established 
village. So they destroy it, they denied it uh, services, water, electricity, and schooling, and so on, and then they ultimately destroyed it, bulldozed it several times, but the sign says, we are steadfast here. The Palestinians kept rebuilding it, Palestinian Bedouin communities, with the help of many uh, uh, peace and justice lovers around the world, including many Israeli Jewish citizens who support their plight. What people do not know as part of the colonizing the mind that I spoke about earlier is uh, this fact about the Nakba. In 1948, and since then, Israel confiscated tens of thousands of Palestinian books and destroyed many of them. According to uh, an Israeli Jewish uh, um, uh, scholar who did his PhD at Ben Gurion University, he just finished his PhD actually, on this very topic. On, on, the, on the fate of Palestinian books that were confiscated from Palestinian private libraries, public libraries, including some of the uh, well-to-do families in Jerusalem, um, their libraries were totally confiscated. Many of those books were destroyed. Thousands of other books are kept in Israeli university libraries, pillaged from their Palestinian owners. Uh, th th they tried to uh, make a self-fulfilling prophecy of the canard, a land without a people to a people without a land, because a land, a people without books, without a culture, are no people. So they tried to make this a reality. And of course, the third right, which is the right of return for Palestinian refugees, and the denial of refugees, their right to return, simply because they're of the wrong type, is the most important aspect of Palestinian existence uh, and Israeli injustice. First, because the majority of Palestinians are refugees. The great majority of Palestinians are refugees. In Gaza, about 80% of the Gaza population are refugees. In the West Bank, it's less. It's about 40% of the West Bank Palestinians are refugees. Inside Israel itself, among the Palestinian community uh, in Israel, uh, about 300,000 are internally displaced persons who are not allowed to go home. They're Israeli citizens. They have deeds to their lands inside their country, which is now Israel, and they're not allowed to go home because they're not Jewish. Simply, there's no pretense. Simply, you're, you're the wrong type. You can't go home. Now, this moves us to why should you care? Well, there are so many reasons beyond basic human solidarity which is a moral obligation. But that's a bit noble. Let's talk about something much more basic than that noble moral obligation. How about doing no harm and ending complicity in crime? That must be fundamental for any human being. You don't need to be Desmond Tutu to recognize that you have an obligation to end complicity in crime. The US, in the last uh, number of years, 10 years, spent about $4 trillion, according to a Brown University study, on its wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, Pakistan, and so on. This whole war industry that started with 9-11, or, or reached a, a, a height after 9-11, $4 trillion were spent. And Israel was always part of that agenda. Not just that the Israel lobby, especially the neocons, played a key role in prodding the US to go to war in Iraq, despite the fact that Iraq had nothing to do with 9-11. And, and even after hundreds of thousands of Iraqis were killed, thousands of American service uh, men and women were killed, and, and billions and billions were spent, the US just got, almost got out of Iraq. It's still there, but most of the troops got out after a huge human loss and financial uh, loss. So, and, and, and the, U.S. wars in Iraq and Afghanistan had a lot of the same dehumanization that we're seeing Israel use against us. So, so the strategic connection between the Israeli establishment and the U.S. establishment has a lot more to do with financial interest, but also with dehumanizing racism against the uh, indigenous populations of those countries. And in Afghanistan, where the U.S. was supposedly liberating Afghani children and women, you all know what's happening there still. With Iraq destroying mosques, just as Israel uh, damaged the Church of Nativity in Bethlehem during the siege, and damaged 
tens of mosques in Gaza during the war of 2008-2009. Again, symptoms of the same racism, that it's okay to destroy or damage or to target houses of prayer of the wrong type people. So, the wrong type people are reduced to relative humans, what I call relative humans. They're not full humans. Full humans are entitled to full human rights. Relative humans are entitled to a subset of the full set of rights. So treating Palestinians, Iraqis, Afghanis, Pakistanis as relative humans allows this soldier that's pulling the trigger, whether he's in an F-16 or a tank or whatever, to say, it's okay, I'm not killing people. They're non-people. And racism abroad feeds on racism at home and feeds racism at home as well. So it's a mutual relationship of, of nourishing each other. And while the US is spending those billions and billions of dollars abroad, part of that in the next 10 years will go to Israel. The US will spend $30 billion in military aid alone between 2009 2018 uh, on Israel, despite the massacres being committed, the ethnic cleansing, the, the, the settler uh, co colonial uh, settlements, and so on and so forth, that Israel is, is building and the wall, it's still getting all this money. Now, let's just take the state of California's share of this amount, just for comparison. The state of California will be funding Israel militarily to the tune of $3.4 billion in those coming 10 years. Imagine what this can do for affordable housing units. You can have 42,254 housing units. This is uh, done by the US campaign to end the Israeli occupation. They have this on their website, uh, very good uh, statistics. Or you could spend, California could spend this money in green jobs, in training people to have green jobs, sustainable environmentally or primary health care for many, many, many Californians who, who desperately need it without universal health care in this country. But why are people silent about this? I'll just quote Desmond Tutu. And for those who cannot read it, I'll read it. The Israeli government is placed on a pedestal in the US. And to critics, it is to be immediate, and, and to criticize it, sorry, is to be immediately dubbed anti-Semitic, as if the Palestinians were not Semitic. People are scared in this country to say wrong is wrong. Desmond Tutu. But silence is complicity. If you don't speak out, if you continue to be scared and intimidated, and you're silent, then you're complicit, because you're not just watching a conflict far away that you have nothing to do with, your tax money is what's funding that occupation and apartheid and denial of basic human rights. Without your tax money, Israel cannot sustain its system of oppression and its non-compliance with international law. So that brings it to a very urgent, moral, political uh, obligation for every single person in this country to do something about it, to at least end this complicity. And when we talk about peace, some people say, okay, but, but this, this is fine, but we can do a lot without doing boycott because we're working for peace. We started getting bored of hearing that term when it's not associated with justice because to the oppressed, peace without justice is institutionalizing injustice. That's exactly what it is. It's telling the slave to accept slavery as fate. That's what peace means if it's not associated with justice. It's meaningless to the oppressed. So it's only uh, peace without justice, as I said, is not worth the, 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 its, its name. It's only when it's associated with justice. And again, as uh, uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu would say, we don't need, if the master becomes nicer, the slave becomes more content. That's not just peace. That's just improved slavery. And as Tutu would say, we do not want our chains comfortable. We want them removed. He said that in front of Congress in, at the height of the struggle against apartheid because the US was suggesting ways to make apartheid more palatable. 
And Tutu was saying, no, we want to end the system. There's no compromise on oppression. End oppression completely. So the movement is very inspired by Mandela and definitely by Dr. Martin Luther King and to a, to a certain extent, a lesser extent, by Gandhi. But it has its roots in decades of Palestinian civil peaceful resistance. As far back as 1933 in Jaffa, uh, Palestinians had massive demonstrations. Jaffa, of course, was the most cosmopolitan of all Palestinian cities with a thriving culture and so on, and, and saw the onslaught of settler colonialism happening inch by inch, town by town, neighborhood by neighborhood, Palestinians uh, uh, being forced out of certain areas, and uh, Jewish settlers coming from Europe escaping the genocide that was just about to start, but the racism mainly in Europe against Jews uh, and coming to Palestine, settling uh, not together with the Palestinians, as some of them had done for quite some time, but replacing, displacing the Palestinians. That was the new trend that was starting to happen in the 30s, and Palestinians started getting alarmed that we're hospitable, but we don't want to give up our living for someone else, especially that we had absolutely nothing to do with the Holocaust. Nothing to do. This is a, a Western European crime against Western European Jews, predominantly, among others, leftists and other uh, groups of people, but, but among uh, a genocide of, of Jews that Palestinians played an, no role in. We should not be the ones paying the full price for that. And of course, resistance had many forms, such as literary resistance, Mahmoud Darwish, poetry, music, dance, and other forms of uh, artistic resistance. And fast forward to the first intifada, and some of you might recognize some faces there, Dr. Gabi Baramki and, and uh, others, Hanan Ashrawi. Um, uh, the first intifada was really the prelude to what we call now the Arab Spring, as many of the leaders of the Arab Spring would say, that the Palestinian nonviolent resistance movement was the main inspiration for the Arab people's revolutions that are, we're seeing across the Arab world. And this is another scene from the first intifada in Beit Sahur, a little Christian town near Bethlehem uh, um, in 1988. I just love this picture because many people don't know that Palestinian women were extremely active in the intifada in many, many ways. And not just cooking for the resistance or, no, they were actively involved in resisting the occupation, in the tax revolt in Beit Sahur. Women played a key, key role in, in, in community economy, collective economy to counter the occupation. And of course, education in itself became a form of resistance because quite often schools were closed, universities were closed in the first intifada for years. We're not talking about shutdown for a week, for years. Education was criminalized completely by Israel. Holding classes in a church or a mosque or a community center was considered illegal by Israeli military policies. And people were arrested and detained if they were carrying books, simply carrying books. So as I said, this was a prelude to the Arab Spring, which I call a prelude to Renaissance, which itself inspired the Occupy movement in this country. And that's an extremely important development. Finally, the US is awakening. This is good news, not just for America, for the world, because the world are victims of your empire. So when people in empire revolt and ask for their rights, that's good news for everyone. Better health service, better education, uh, better everything in this country spells better peace with justice for the world because there's less money being spent on killing and occupying and military bases and, and fleets and so on. So, that, so we are part of this 99%, the global 99% against injustice and for justice, freedom and equal rights. The Palestinian cause is above everything else a, a question of justice, freedom and equality. And that's what the movement in this country is, is calling for. So we came up with the slogan in the BDS movement, Occupy Wall Street, not Palestine, which I'll talk about in my lecture in Oakland, um, because it's, it's, it's very important to see those connections. It's the same military industry and the economy that's, that's oppressing people in this country. It's also oppressing people abroad. We have to see those connections in the struggles. And as Nelson Mandela once said, 
about all this discussion about despite this, we should be fair and balanced, despite all what I said. Mandela said something very important. In the, in the context of talking about the Palestinians, he was talking about the question of Palestine here. He said, we can easily be enticed to read reconciliation and fairness as meaning parity between justice and injustice. And he completely rejected any parity between justice and injustice. So in, in South Africa, they said absolutely no parity between oppressor and oppressed. End oppression, and then we can talk. There's no dialogue, coexistence, and before ending oppression. Any dialogue and coexistence should be just as a form of co-resistance. As a Palestinian young activist uh, dubbed the term, we should have co-resistance, not coexistence, as long as oppression uh, uh, exists. We have to end oppression, and then we can live like normal, equal human beings. Before that, the only relationship between us and the Israelis has to be co-resistance to oppression. That's the only normal relation between an oppressed community and an oppressor community. Because otherwise, if we believe that, okay, I do not like the uh, occupation, but I like Israel and I support Israel, that's the same as saying, back in the 17th, 18th century, I support the US, but I'm against slavery. Or, I support South Africa, but I'm against apartheid. And it's the same, saying, I support Israel, but I'm against the occupation. What does that mean? The occupation is not this external element that Israel has some vague relationship to. That's Israel that's committing this occupation and those racist laws and denying refugees the right to return. So, parity cannot happen between injustice and justice. Yeah, I love this picture too. <laughs> Uh, and and uh, despite all this oppression, we insist on the moral right. We insist on moral resistance, which does not believe in reversing injustice so that we become the oppressors and they become the oppressed. That's not removing injustice. That's entrenching it, but reversing it. We want to end injustice so that everyone can enjoy equal rights. No one becomes the oppressor. This is why the boycott movement focused on many aspects. I'll talk quickly about the economic, academic, and cultural. In the economic field, Veolia, which has many contracts in this state, in this city, I think, as well, uh, lost, since we started our campaign against Veolia, which is involved in the Jerusalem Light Trail. Uh, the Jerusalem Light Trail, for those who don't know, is an Israeli project that connects the Israeli colonies in and around occupied Jerusalem with the city to make the colonies much more attractive for Israeli settlers to move to. So it's a war crime. Building colonies is a war crime. Servicing those colonies is complicity in war crimes. Veolia and Alstom, two French companies, uh, were involved, are involved in this Jerusalem light trail, among other violations of international law. We started a campaign against Veolia, and until now, three years after we started the campaign, Veolia lost $12 billion worth of contracts. And it was citizens, just like you, getting together, and pressuring city councils to exclude Veolia from bidding for water, sanitation, transportation contracts, big public contracts. They lost so many contracts in Sweden, Britain, Ireland, uh, um, uh, France, one contract, Australia, one contract. So, and this was done by citizens who believed in this and used the law and used political pressure to get results. Another company, Alstom, which I mentioned, lost, just lost a few weeks ago, a huge, massive contract in Saudi Arabia worth $9.4 billion because of political pressure that we applied on the Saudi uh, government that you cannot partner with among all your other problems. You can't even allow a, a company involved in the colonization of Jerusalem to work in Saudi Arabia. And it was excluded on political grounds. Uh, uh, Norway, which, is, which has the third largest pension fund in the world, uh, was pressured by some groups in this country, Adala New York, as well as a Palestinian group, Stop the Wall, and an Israeli group who profits from the occupation, which is a project of the Coalition of Women for Peace, a very wonderful, courageous Israeli women coalition that has adopted BDS, and they produce the website Who Profits from the Occupation, which is whoprofits.org. Who profits one word? .org. It's a database of international Israeli and other companies that are involved 
in the occupation, that are profiting from the occupation. So all three groups, Israeli, Palestinian, and American, pressured the Norwegian government until they divested. We won that battle. They divested from Elbit Systems and from Africa Israel, two companies directly involved in Israel's violations of international law. Elbit is helping to build the, your wall with Mexico, by the way. Another big success we had in the economic field is the uh, campaign against Agrexco. Agrexco was, now we finally can use the past tense, was Israel's largest exporter of produce, mainly to Europe, but also to this country, for decades. It was like this iconic Israeli company that could never go bad. But with a massive campaign, basically in France, Britain, Ireland, uh, Nordic countries, Sweden, Italy, Spain, and other places, they lost so much revenue that helped may, uh, the company go bankrupt, this wasn't the only factor that led to the bankruptcy, but it was certainly one of the most effective factors. In the trade union uh, world, we have massive support from COSATU, the South African Trade Union Federation, CUT, the Brazilian, the Scottish, the Irish, the British. By the way, the British has about 6.57 million members. I know something you envy in this country, that a union can have this many members and can be effective. Solidaire in France, uh, FIOM in Italy, and many, many, many other unions have joined the BDS movement. But the largest support has come from South Africa, uh, uh, not surprisingly. Uh, unions went into action responding to the Freedom Flotilla massacre, which was in May of 2010. Many people were very angry at what Israel did on the high seas. And the BDS National Committee said, don't get angry, get into action, do something about it. It's not enough to get angry, burn Israeli flags or American flags or whatever. Uh, it's not enough to vent out. You have to do something effective about to end this. Trade, we called on trade unions around the world, especially dock workers unions, to boycott Israeli ships. Besiege the siege. That was the title. Israel is besieging Gaza, will besiege Israel to raise the price of its siege, refuse to offload or load Israeli ships. The Swedish Dock Workers Union heeded our call for several days, eight to nine days. Uh, Cochin, the fourth largest port in India, heeded our call. Uh, in Turkey, in South Africa, in Greece, and in Oakland, California as well. For 24 hours, Oakland, California dock workers refused to offload an Israeli ship, setting a, a historic precedent in this country. The academic and cultural boycott aspect is a very important part of the campaign, not symbolically only, because the Israeli Academy especially, but also culture, plays a key role in planning, justifying, and whitewashing Israeli oppression. Our partners in the US, the US campaign for the academic and cultural boycott of Israel, have done an excellent job since 2009 to raise awareness on campuses and to actually get involved in campaigns. The beginning of a, of a cultural and academic boycott, boycotting Israeli academic and cultural institutions, and it's not against individuals. It's a key uh, uh, point to remember. The boycott is not against individual Israelis, it's against institutions that are complicit. And finally, BDS crossed the Atlantic and it reached the US. Of course, it reached Canada first, but um, from the beginning it reached Canada, but we'll ignore that for a moment. And there were several wonderful campaigns. The US campaign to end the Israeli occupation is an umbrella group of many of the groups doing BDS in this country. But Adala New York are famed for their Christmas chorals, subversive chorals, uh, carols, sorry, uh, uh, about the occupation and so on. The Ahava campaign by Coat Pink against um, the company Ahava, that's a cosmetics company using minerals from the occupied territories, of, used in a, from a settlement in the occupied territories. So many very creative, wonderful campaigns were started for BDS in this country. And of course, the famous flash mobs, including this New York flash mob in, at Grand Central Station, which was banned uh, by YouTube because they used the music of a group that was convinced to threaten lawsuit. Uh, but, and as I said, the, the Code Pink campaign against Ahava, where you see a lot of creativity and sustainability, which are very important principles in the BDS uh, movement. Many Jewish groups, after the attack on Gaza, and especially after the flotilla, have done a lot of work with the BDS movement. Whether they endorse BDS or not, they did a lot of excellent work on boycott, divestment, and sanctions 
campaigns. This includes Jewish Voice for Peace, which is leading the, the campaign against TIAA CREF, the huge pension fund in this country. Uh, they're trying to pressure TIAA CREF to divest from five companies that are profiting from Israel's occupation and violation of international law. The International Jewish Anti-Zionist Network, IJAN, uh, is leading, really, the campaign to stop the JNF, the Jewish National Fund, which, as I explained, is a racist colonial entity involved in ethnic cleansing of the Palestinians. American Jews for a Just Peace have some campaigns, uh, BDS campaigns, and so on. The, the main principle, the unspoken principle here, is that not in our name. Israel shall not be allowed to speak on behalf of world Jewry. Enough is enough. It's a colonial state, it's an occupier, it cannot speak on behalf of all world Jews. And of course, Hampshire College was the first in the US to divest in 2009 from six companies uh, implicated in Israel's occupation. And the, the Berkeley battle, and it was a true battle, at least Israel treated it as a battle. The Israeli ambassador, the consul in the Bay Area, the entire Zionist lobby got together, had this war chamber, how to combat the students of SJP, Students for Justice in Palestine at Berkeley, to stop them from passing a divestment resolution, which passed by a large majority, but not enough to override the president's veto. So the entire Israeli establishment and the US support group was, was involved in this battle at Berkeley University. Imagine how scared they are of this peaceful movement. And of course, the first uh, conference for the Students for Justice was held at Columbia University just last October. A BDS conference, student conference will be held at University of Pennsylvania this coming February. Uh, so US campuses uh, are, are increasingly adopting BDS and doing excellent creative work on that account. Uh, now about churches, and I'm reaching the end here, an ethical investment. As we know, the Presbyterian Church was the first to, to start the discussion about the need for divestment, ethical investment. It's a slow process. There are many, many hurdles, many obstacles. The lobby is doing its absolute best to intimidate, to bully, or to entrap uh, some uh, uh, church leaders into an endless, useless dialogue that, that, that leads to absolute nothing other than talk, 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 and do nothing. And we're very aware of this trap, and we can talk more about it. And of course, the Methodist, the United Methodist uh, Church. I mention those two in particular because their general assemblies are coming up. The United Methodist will happen April or May, and then the Presbyterian in, in, uh, in June, I think. These are extremely important conferences because they will discuss ethical investment motions. And if they pass, finally, this will be a game changer in the US, given the weight of the two churches. So everyone who's involved even remotely with the Methodists or the Presbyterians, we need your help now to push for accepting this uh, uh, motion for ethically invest, uh, investing to withdraw money from companies that violate the Presbyterian church's principle. And the Methodists, of course. Now this is very important uh, as well, the, the boycott at Olympia. Yes, they deserve a huge applause. We're very proud of what BDS activists uh, in Olympia have done, uh, passing a boycott against Israeli products, the first of its kind in the US. So this is extremely important at the Olympia Food Co-op. And Alice Walker, uh, some major cultural figures in this country. When we said BDS crossed the Atlantic, it crossed it with vengeance. I mean, some really big names have endorsed BDS. Alice Walker, who spoke about Rosa Parks, would have done BDS specifically to soothe the pain and attend the sorrows of a people wrongly treated for generations. Uh, Stéphane Essel is French, not in the US, but I moved back to France because of his importance and weight. He's a co-author of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. This is really a living legend, one of the people who wrote the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, a Holocaust survivor, obviously, he's Jewish, and he said, BDS campaigns around the world present the most promising way to overcome the failure of world governments to stand up to Israel's intransigence and lawless behavior. Coming back to the US, Judith Butler, the very famous academic 
uh, feminist LGBT activist uh, said, BDS is the only way that, that citizens can call for the enforcement of international law. In the cultural field, cultural boycott has spread massively since we started the campaign, especially after the flotilla uh, attack, where performing in Israel has become like performing in Sun City in South Africa in the past. It's a sin, Sin City as it was called. So now uh, Tel Aviv is portrayed as the other Sun City that should be boycotted just as well. And, and uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu said exactly that. Just as we said during apartheid that it was inappropriate for international artists to perform in South Africa in a society founded on discriminatory laws and racial exclusivity, so it would be wrong for Cape Town Opera to perform in Israel. So he lobbied Cape Town Opera, but they did not heed his call or ours and did violate the boycott, unfortunately. And they were criticized across the board in South Africa for, for uh, seeking profit ahead of principle. And again, for, for those double standard people who say, oh, but art should be above politics. Why wasn't it in Sun City? Many artists did heal our call. Gil Scott Heron, uh, Elvis Costello, The Pixies, Snoop Dogg, um, Ken Loach, um, and, and others, many, many, many others. The list is too long uh, to enumerate uh, here, have heeded our boycott call and refused to play Israel. Now, the very last part, the churches. Until 2009, there was no clear-cut Christian Palestinian voice calling for BDS. Many Christian activists, like other Palestinians, were involved in BDS, but there was no official Christian voice calling for BDS until 2009. With the publication of the Kairos Palestine document, major Christian figures from all denominations Catholic, Anglican, uh, various Protestant denominations, Orthodox, the biggest denomination in Palestine, endorsed BDS as an ethical, uh, uh, religious obligation. Religious obligation. This is a theological document, the Kairos Palestine, that we hope you can help spread in this country, based on Christian theology that says a, a Christian should resist injustice by nonviolent means, and do his or her best to end injustice. And BDS is part of the arsenal of nonviolent measures that any good Christian can adopt in order to end, to help end this uh, injustice. And this was followed recently by the Bethlehem call of 2011. And this is a cartoon by Naji Al Ali, the most famous Palestinian cartoonist. Uh, I just used it, uh, they did not use it in the document, I just used it in this context and it shows uh, uh, Jesus kicking the occupation in the butt. <laughs> and it says, Intifada of the West Bank and Gaza. So the Bethlehem call that came out from the Kairos group, which is extremely important, again, to publicize in this country, in, in churches, had those three uh, principles. Occupation no more, dismantling Israeli apartheid, demand that the right of return for all Palestinian refugees be enforced. So they adopted the same rights-based principles of the BDS call, exactly. Occupation, apartheid, refugees, the three basic calls in, in harmony with the consensus among Palestinians. So now we have the most influential Christian voices in Palestine calling for the main principles of BDS and calling for BDS specifically. Again, the key issue is do no harm at the very least. If you cannot help us in the struggle, at least end your part of complicity in our oppression. And as I say everywhere, our oppression has made in the USA written all over it. It is beyond a, 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 a nicety or being supportive of sta or standing in, in, in international solidarity. It's a basic moral obligation. It's no heroism to end complicity in crimes. And BDS is a very promising form of nonviolent resistance that Israel today calls a strategic threat. It works, it is working, but we need everyone to help us with it. And as Martin Luther King Jr. said, change does not roll in on the wheels of inevitability, but comes through continuous struggle. And so we must straighten our backs and work for our freedom. A man can't ride you unless your back is bent. 
In BDS, we're straightening our backs for freedom, justice, and equality. This is what Martin Luther King would have done. Thank you. Well done.